We'll call the meeting to order um, at uh, 12.05. I think President <laughs> is uh, Board Member Nelson, Board Member Martin, Board Member Bixler, Board Member Stroman. Uh, am I missing anybody here? Uh, Greg Collins, Director Collins, are you on? I don't see him. And uh, Director Medeiros apologizes, Chair Medeiros. He had an emergency and was unable to make uh, the meeting. So at this time, we'll take uh, public comments. Uh, if there's any public that would like to make a comment on any subject within the jurisdiction of the board, including items on the agenda, uh, speakers will be allowed three minutes unless otherwise extended by the board chair. The board cannot legally discuss or take official action on items presented under public comment. Um, if you have a public comment, um, please at this time unmute and state your name and uh, we can get you into the queue. Is there anybody that would like public comment? Hearing none, I guess we will move on with our agenda. Um, the first thing I wanted to bring to the board's attention was a request that came out of last month's meeting or March's earlier meeting uh, regarding, regarding an issue that was brought to the attention of the board, the State Water Resources Control Board uh, comment letter potentially on recommendations for an effective water rights response uh, to climate change. Uh, excuse me, there's some couple people waiting in the waiting room. There we go. So I wanted to start off with a quick uh, presentation on that to cover what we've uh, reviewed. Uh, let me pull it up here. So as was presented at the last board meeting, uh, the State Water Resources Control Board has released uh, a report recommendations for effective water rights response to climate change. And based upon the initial read of that, the, I think Valerie and I had some concerns with where the report was headed. Uh, we've kind of furthered that review yeah. and wanted to bring some of our um, potential comments to the board. Um, wasn't planning on seeking uh, a direct uh, board approval to submit the letter. The intent here is for me to develop a letter in uh, coordination with uh, Valerie, and I will submit that uh, under my general interim general manager uh, signature to the State Water Resources Control Board. It'll also be co-signed by myself under Tulare Irrigation District also. A little background, the State Water Resources Control Board under resolution 2017-12, uh, which was called the Comprehensive Response to Climate Change, um, uh, advised staff to embed climate change consideration into all programs and activities, including the need to evaluate and make recommendations on regulatory and policy changes regarding the use of models to account for projected impacts of climate change when conducting water rights availability analysis. So this was the genesis of why the report was created. The report attempts to provide an overview of the California water rights system, uh, describes some of the principles of water availability analysis and permitting the process, um, a summary of existing information uh, on climate change impacts, and then it identifies a range of approaches to respond to climate change through a list of staff recommendations. Um, comments, uh, are due to the state board on March 31st. Um, the deadline was extended to March 31st. So the, the concerns that I've kind of highlighted that our comments will be focused on uh, include these list of eight items we're kind of looking at. So the first uh, issue we're concerned with is, um, hold on a second, we got some people coming into the, Can you hear me now? There we go. Got you, Dave. <laughs> um, you, so I'll keep going, Dave, um, and then we'll bring you back in the, you're back in control. Um, the, you, are, have you started the meeting already? Yeah, we're, we're into agenda item, uh, the first agenda item, which is the State Water Resource Control Board uh, recommendation. Okay, we'll call this meeting order. <laughs> 
Um, the first issue I was kind of looking at is in the letter, it's definite that um, there's a lack of recognition in the local um, efforts that are t undertaken to adjust for climate change. You know, if you look at Tulare Irrigation District, over 100 years of uh, existence, um, our system is designed as a conjunctive use system. So it's meant to accommodate those uh, shifting hydrology. We're seeing earlier peak flows and in rainfall and less snowpack. So the idea is we put more in the ground when it's available and pump it out when we need it. So I think there's just a general lack of that understanding. And, and in some of the other comments, you'll, you'll see that we recommend that they start talking with entities on how we are addressing climate change. Because one of the, the issues is maybe they don't need to adjust water rights. They need to keep that static while allowing us to adjust our operations. Um, because if you start turning the dial on water rights, it could be problematic. Um, it's not clear whether there was a legal review of the recommendations in the report and yes, please. water rights, you know, are based upon legal, um, actions. So we're recommending that uh, legal review take place and some acknowledgement that this comports with availability of the state water report resource control board to do the things that they're recommending. Um, we, we request a clear definition of the impacted water rights um, uh, in the report. So it's not clear. Um, there was a workshop uh, about a week ago that, that it was clear in their initial discussion that, that this only applies to new water rights being sought uh, at the state board. Um, so we require new things for new water rights. But as, as Valerie and I looked into it a little deeper, that's not quite true because some of the recommendations actually impact or could impact existing water rights. So um, they need to clearly define that. Um, again, this reliance on changing water rights before allowing adaption by local agencies. So as we are trying to comply with Sigma, um, we built our GSPs on specific water rights and availability of those water rights. If they begin to change those water rights, it puts our GSP in a different status um, point. And we'll have to react to that. Um, there's truly a lack of economic and social considerations. Um, I do believe that the, you know, they have good intentions of trying to look at climate change. However, um, they're not looking at if they turn that dial, what could be the social or economic impact um, of turning that dial? Uh, it's been probably one of my uh, only criticisms of Sigma's main legislation is there was a then the largest is that there's a lack of economic uh, impact analysis in that in Sigma. Uh, we've done it subsequently and it looks really bad, but that was never required at the onset. And then specifically in the recommendations that they're promoting uh, recommendation 7-9, which is revised the fully appropriated streams list, both water supplies that come into the Cahuilla subbasin, specifically in the TID, um, have their sources in fully appropriated stream systems, meaning those systems don't have any available water rights uh, that somebody could appropriate unless they reopen the fully appropriated streams designation. And what the report recommends is they should reopen that for discussion. And again, with the claim that they don't impact um, existing water rights, opening up the fully appropriated streams would impact existing water rights and, their, and the users. So um, I think it's really not a, a wise idea to make that recommendation. Um, so I'm, I will put that in my comment letter. Um, recommendation 7-11 plan for droughts. Um, they acknowledge the, the need for a statewide curtailment um, process, uh, be a little bit more um, um, uh, prepared for, for instance, this year. And while uh, it's understandable that, you know, they would want to do a statewide curtailment kind of policy or program so people might understand better what the curtailment is. I, uh, I think statewide, each watershed river system is so unique that a statewide program would be difficult, if not cause more confusion. I think there needs to just be more uh, coordination with the local watersheds to coordinate their curtailments if at the last resort it's needed. And then lastly, um, recommendation 7-12, coordinate with other agencies and partners. Um, obviously there's one big 
missing piece of that list and that's the local agencies and the water rights users they talk about coordinating with other state agencies and scientists and but again the users and the water rights holders were not included in that uh, coordination so so these are the eight items i'd be focusing on um, and what i wanted to seek is any feedback or concern um, and then maybe just a general consensus from the mid Kauia board that they're comfortable with these being the topics um, I would be preparing, finalizing the letter this weekend and getting it out uh, next week. So that's the end of my report. Uh, are there any questions? Um, oh, Howard, I apologize. You went back on mute. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, I was just looking at uh, your 7-12, and you were saying that uh, they need to coordinate with uh, local agencies, which, of course, I concur with, but, uh, but it does state in um, the, the uh, recommendation report that uh, with the growing body of research, there is an opportunity to build upon the knowledge and gains made by state and other agencies. So would that and other agencies uh, relate or refer to those local agencies that you mentioned? It could, I, I, I would like them to just spell out and make the concerted effort to reach out to the watersheds. You know, in, the, in our basin, we have the Queen and St. John's Rivers Association that they should be talking with the units in the association. So being a little bit more specific is, is what you recommend. Yeah, recommend. yeah. And, and specifically highlighting that that needs to be done. I see. Question here, I mean, reading the report, I agree with you totally. Um, I think the local input is, is not there. Um, I think it's in, I live in the world and a lot of people on this call or the Zoom meeting do, um, I think it's a grab by Sacramento and it's a grab by state agencies and I think Purposely, I think the local entities are left out of this uh, dynamic, and I think it needs to be spelled out. But isn't the caveat in a severe drought situation, the fallback would be emergency uh, declaration by the governor, and then would this nullify any and all aspects of this report? Valerie, you might have to weigh in on this, or we might have to find an answer, but I believe it requires both, right? Or is a curtailment order independent of the governor's drought declaration? That's right. So in 2014 and 2015, <clears throat> excuse me, the governor um, issued a drought declaration. And then after that, the state water board, uh, I think it's 1058.5, has emergency drought um, curtailment powers that are triggered by that, that they can use. They also have regular non-drought emergency curtailment. But um, if the governor issued a drought declaration tomorrow would not curtail anyone's uh, water right, the State Water Resources Control Board has to do that. And the issue that they ran into the last drought is that you know curtailment, we're dealing with property rights and we're dealing with really specific data on individual rivers. If you're going to tell someone to curtail up in a tributary because you've kind of done this macro analysis, but there's water flowing by them that's not appropriated, you know, it obviously becomes a problem. So one of the big challenges for the state water board in curtailment is this local versus statewide issue. They have to know local data to get it right, um, and they can't really use the, the statewide data or watershed-wide data that they used last time. Um, the uh, Santa Clara District Court already set aside their curtailments from the 2014, 2015 drought because they weren't supported by localized information. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Aaron, I have a question that probably be more related. Uh, it'd probably be better if Valerie answered this. On, on uh, number six, the recommendation seven, nine, revise the fully appropriated stream list. First off, who is going to revise that? And secondly, man, there's some pre-1914, you know, um, rights that there's going to be, you're going to see a lot of leak. I think <laughs> more lawyers are going to be needed, I think. Uh, but uh, what, who's going to revise that? Yeah, so the fully appropriated stream list, um, 
it is a list obviously kept by the State Water Resources Control Board. You can petition to take a river off that list. That's what's happening in the Kings Basin right now is that um, someone did petition the State Water Resources Control Board to take the Kings River off that fully appropriated list because they claimed that there was high flood flows available for appropriation. Um, the State Water Board's considering that, but again, it all, it all kind of comes back. I feel like I'm a, a repeating myself here, but it all comes back to localized data, right? You can't just say statewide, we're gonna remove all the fully appropriated stream designations. It has to be supported by science and data um, and, and a lot, to your point, not only legal, but a lot of experts, a lot of hydrogeologists are gonna have to come in and talk about um, not only historical flows, but new high flood flows, if there is a change from climate change in this more flashy system. So, um, I mean, my sense is, I hope the State Water Board know, that I think that, I hope that recommendation was a high level, we could do this in the future, because it takes a lot of data and it takes a lot of petitions to, to remove those. Certainly, if the recommendation is as broad as we should just remove those statewide, um, I mean, I, I'd say that's way outside their authority. So that, that would be a, a big problem. But it would be the board, the State Water Resources Control Board, that controls that list and revisits it if necessary. And again, to, specifically to the Cuya Subbasin, we've designed our projects and our management actions around a fully appropriated stream with pre-1914 water rights and contracts on the CBP. If the fully appropriated streams designations gets opened up on both the Cahuilla and the San Joaquin River, we would, uh, we would be at jeopardy of not having those water rights in order to fill those projects and management actions. And we would be spending our time defending that fully appropriated stream designation. So that's my concern is that it's another, it, it causes some division of the, our abilities, right? So we're gonna have to go defend and try and move forward. So we probably won't make progress. We'll be stuck in idle mode, so. Well, and I, I think of the, the uh, riparian users that have been a filing applications with the, um, you know, the Cuyah and St. John's Rivers Association. And, um, <laughs> you know, I start thinking, you know, here we are going through all this process of including them, et cetera. And who's to say that they revise <laughs> the appropriations and those guys are the ones who wind up with the water and we don't, you know, I mean, anything wacky could happen. So I just find that bizarre that here for, for as long as I've been in water, we always, it's the Bible, the 1914 uh, water rights. And, and, uh, and now it's just going to be changed, you know. That's the risk here, and that's why we, you know, the it was brought to actually Jeff Van and Hubel brought it to the attention of the Greater Cuya, where where I picked up on it, and then contacted uh, Valerie. And, and after I read it, I, I yeah, there's clear and definite risks to folks in Sigma compliance. So, well, without any other questions, I guess what I would like to just do is, if without any other concerns, I will. <laughs> prepare a letter, uh, uh, have Valerie review it. Um, I am trying to coordinate with others in the Cahuilla Subbasin. I know Mark Larson's on the call. I've, I've sent him the letter um, he, and he, he's investigating it on behalf of the association. So, um, and then TID would, uh, will be a signatory to the letter also. So, okay, great. So Dave, it's all yours again. <laughs> okay, I didn't get to do the um, call to order event. Oh well. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I believe we we kind of agreed to this letter anyway last meeting, didn't we? Uh, uh, and and uh, <clears throat> we did. I, I believe we did. So we'll just we wait did. for your uh, final uh, final copy. Yeah, I'll probably bring the final draft back to the, I mean, it'll be the final letter sent. I'll have it for you at the April 13th mid Cuya board meeting. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, we'll move on to uh, item four. Uh, a little heads up on that. I think Aaron's going to give us a, a, a little uh, training session on, uh, on how to, how to, uh, how to <laughs> go about this uh, workshop. And I think he's going to turn it over to uh, Valerie, but uh, we have Subbasin Water Rights presentation and workshop. Take it away, Aaron. Yeah, for the, the group, um, the 
this was brought up as we begin in the mid career to have start having discussions on policies, projects, management actions. Um, uh, we had a presentation probably about two years ago uh, regarding water rights and the water accounting framework and how that was all developed. But you know, two years is a long time ago. We've done a lot in the meantime. And as we get prepared to start having more discussions, um, I thought it was just a good opportunity to refresh ourselves as we you know, begin to make some difficult decisions here in the near future. So um, you don't want an engineer giving a presentation on legal matters. We break <laughs> down into numbers and it doesn't work right and we get in trouble and, uh, and, and then the attorney bills go up, right, Valerie? Because <laughs> we get it wrong. So Valerie, and, and I will admit when we originally started this a couple of years ago, the three uh, councils for the GSAs got together to hammer this kind of approach out. And they did, a, uh, in my mind, a great job of getting everybody's concepts onto the table and agree to a three bucket system, which it relates to an engineer or a common person on how to do this all. So Valerie has prepared a, um, a presentation for you folks. We're, we're going to call it a workshop. Um, we've invited folks from throughout the Kuya Subbasin, um, and there's quite a few people here on this Zoom call here. Um, the way we're going to do this, Valerie's going to give a presentation. We are going to, if you have questions, um, feel free to put those questions first into the chat window uh, in Zoom, and I'll be moderating, trying to moderate those questions. If you don't have the ability to do chat or don't know how to do it, you can kind of raise your hand or try and unmute yourself, but we prefer you do it in the chat. And then lastly, there's some folks here on by phone. And what we'll do is we will open up every once in a while to stop and ask if anybody on the phones have any questions for, for Valerie. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna turn the screen share back over to um, Valerie here. And I'll let her Thanks. get started. Great, I'll try to figure this out here. Um, can you guys see that? Yep. See my screen, yep. Yep. Okay, great. Um, okay, great. So like Aaron said, if you guys have questions, um, I'm more than happy to take them as they come in. Um, this presentation is a little bit kind of designed like a funnel. We're gonna start really wide and then we're gonna quickly go down to kind of uh, two probably major rabbit hole issues where we're gonna get really specific. Um, so when we do that, a lot of times waiting for questions about whether it's the really wide or as we get down to the funnel picture, it's hard to climb back out of that funnel. So please ask as I go along um, and, and, you know, and any question is a good question. Um, and it, like I said, it gets complicated quickly. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about groundwater, um, law and, and the application thereof. This is kind of the agenda background history, Sigma and, and the status of the mid Kauia, um, process are the three really easy, um, big picture top of the funnel items. Um, four and five is probably those are the agenda items that are going to be um, I'm going to spend the most time on, and that will get more complicated as we get to them. So one, two, and three will go really quickly, but uh, four and five will get us stuck in the mud pretty quick here. So, all right, background history. Um, there's a guy mining. For those who don't know, the uh, the history of the water rights system in California is actually from miners and mining rights. Sometimes you still see miners inches and that kind of stuff. But um, so it, it is an, an interesting background history. It's most interesting when you look at how the state uh, developed the surface water system compared to the groundwater system. The surface water system changed dramatically in 1914 when um, what was then called the Water Commission, what we call today the State Water Resources Control Board, developed uh, a surface water permitting system. And that's the system that we know today. That's the distinguishment between pre-14 and post-14 rights, right? So any pre-14 right doesn't have the jurisdiction of the State Water Board because they didn't issue it. After 1914, those are rights issued by the State Water Resources Control um, Board. And, um, and they're the board that kind of regulates all of those post-1914 rights. 
1914, there was a lot of legislative history about this, and they did talk about in 1914 when they developed the surface water permitting system, they talked about developing a similar groundwater um, system. And there are a couple of funny comments where people say, we could just never do it. That, that's crazy. And we can't handle that right now. Um, so no similar permitting system was developed in 1914 for groundwater. And it actually ended up taking 100 years um, to, to then take, a, I guess, a long deep breath and figure out Sigma 100 years later. Sigma came on. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but what does that really mean? It, it, you know, there's a lot of discussion about in Sigma about interconnection, but we really have two different legal systems. So we have a little bit of a siloed legal system. We've got the, the permitting and a state regulatory body for the surface water. And then for groundwater over the last hundred years, all of the rules that um, we have lived by pre-Sigma have come out through case law. And that is from adjudications to one groundwater user complaining about his neighboring groundwater users' rights and going to the court and saying, we think this isn't fair, tell us the rules. So really, um, there are some parts of groundwater law that are very established because those came out of specific cases, specific arguments where people um, were complaining about other people's groundwater use. Um, a lot of that happened, frankly, in the southern part of the state where, um, where water is you know, less available and people were arguing about groundwater much more. But it, but it came up with like a little bit of a patchwork. Um, there are some issues that there's a lot of groundwater rules established through case law. And then there are some issues where you come upon it and you think, gosh, it's hard to believe there are no rules on that, um, but there just aren't. So it's a little patchworky when it comes to, to groundwater and compared to the surface water system. So then, um, then 100 years later, Sigma came along with Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. I think everyone on this call is probably very familiar with that, but I'll talk a little <clears> bit <throat> about from a, from a big picture perspective, what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, these are the folks that signed. That's actually the signing of Sigma right there, that picture. I'm sure folks have seen it before. So what, what does Sigma do? Well, I can tell you what it doesn't do. It does not establish a permitting system, okay? So unlike surface water still, even after Sigma, you don't have a system where you go to a body and you say, I would like a permit to extract groundwater. And they give that to you and you can hold it up and say, this is, this is my right and this is how much I get to divert in which season, which place of use. So again, it, it, Sigma does not create a permitting system. Instead, it focuses on sustainability and local management, right? So it gives it over to locals to manage. Um, and interestingly, although it doesn't require a permitting system, uh, I think in, in the first couple of years of Sigma, the, the need to manage and develop at a local level. I think most GSAs have quickly understood the need to, I guess, frame the problem lack of, a, of a better word. And, and what that means is we have to develop solutions to manage. And it's very difficult to do that without understanding um, how much water there is and who owns what water and who's allowed to extract that water in which times. Um, so even though there's not a permitting system, in order to comply with Sigma, GSAs really have to understand um, what water is out there, how it's treated legally, and who can do what with it when. So those are those are hard things to, to figure out. So not a permitting system, but we really have to understand that we have to define, define the system. Um, Sigma also specifically calls out in really big letters, and this was very controversial when Sigma was being written, that there's no change to water rights. Okay. Sigma comes in and says, we're not changing your water right. If you have a groundwater right, Sigma is not coming in to take that away. Um, that was a very big concern. The, the concept that 100 years later, you do put in this permitting system and everyone has to run and get a permit and that the existing rights that you have um, depended on would be gone was a really big issue. Uh, so on, on one hand, Sigma says, nope, we're not deciding any other rights. But on the other hand, Sigma provides GSAs with sufficient authority that they can, they can limit extractions. So on, on one hand, it doesn't affect your right. But on the other hand, if you're using water unsustainably, uh, GSAs do have the authority to limit the use of that right. They probably can't extinguish it altogether. But um, we've had many, many people kind of ask on the ground when I'm using groundwater, um, 
even though Sigma doesn't af af take my right away, if a GSA is telling me I can only use 50% of it, how, how is that different to me on the ground? You know, does it really make a difference? So there have been a lot of questions about whether the no change to your right is kind of a distinction without, without a difference. Does it, does it really matter if then GSAs have the ability to limit you? And that's a tough question that I think we're all still, still dealing with. Um, and then finally, Sigma still reserves that the county has the authority to um, permit groundwater wells. And again, that's if you wanna go to the county and get a brand new well, it's more of a land use issue. The county is not gonna tell you how much water you can pull out of that well, which is again, goes back to the GSAs and the management issue. Um, but if you want to actually do the land use portion of putting a new well in or abandoning a well, capping it off, the county still does have that authority. So certainly GSAs coming out of Sigma don't have to do a permitting system, but they do to manage correctly need to understand um, who owns what water and who can do what with it. And they also have to continue to go to the county to um, talk to the county about new wells coming on and where those wells are and um, how those new wells may affect the existing GSP. Those are all things that GSAs need to do after Sigma. All right. Oh, all right. So the mid uh, Kawea process, this is just a map of um, the Kawea subbasin GSAs. As you can see um, that the entire colored outline is the subbasin, and then you can see the GSAs in there. There are three GSAs. Um, and again, going back to what these GSAs have to do is local management. So where are we now? Um, in the GSPs, for each of the three GS GSAs developed GSPs, and, and this is a pretty high level summary for, for kind of the public here, but the water accounting framework was developed, as Aaron mentioned, um, the three GSAs collaborated as they have to do under Sigma, make sure that their GSPs are consistent. Um, in order to, to deal with that, defining the problem and coming up with solutions, which is you know our GSP, the GSAs did all meet in this basin and, and they agreed generally about how to treat different types of groundwater. Um, and the, the, this meeting was based on kind of general rule principles of law. All of that stuff is in the GSPs. I'm not saying anything new that you don't can't, can't open each of the GSPs and see this, but um, the general water accounting framework came up with three buckets of water, native, imported, or foreign. I think it might be called in some of the GSPs and salvaged. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot more about those different types of water later on when we kind of get down into the funnel. But from a big picture perspective, um, although those are the categories, the tough part is never defining the category. It's defining which molecule of water goes into which category and therefore who owns it, who controls it, who can extract it. Um, so that's the next steps. I know that the mid COEA included kind of a water accounting um, and it was, it was this first initial um, accounting which did put specific water molecules into each bucket and it, and it did provide that accounting. But there was an asterisk, I think, in everyone's plan that we had to have more discussion about exactly how the molecules went in each one and how the um, accounting would, would, how each accounting and fact scenario really will um, drill down into these three buckets of water. So I don't think those buckets are necessarily gonna change, but I think the idea of which molecule in which year goes into which bucket. I think there's some discussion left to be had on that and some finalization of that. So I think in the in the GSPs, it's fair to say that we put kind of an asterisk there and said, we'll, we'll have to talk more about this in our in our five-year update and in and in future plans. So that's that's where the basin I think kind of is. Um, now I'm gonna move on to the summary of, of groundwater rights. I'm gonna talk about the four basic kinds of water rights and we're beginning to move into um, I think it's exciting, but I have no doubt that some people will think it's a little bit more dry and boring. Um, the rules of categories, and really that's that's what we should talk about. This first part, this first funnel part of summary of groundwater rights is just talking about the categories and what kind of, of rights you can have if you're a groundwater extractor. Um, and then we're going to talk about all the really interesting fact components of how priority figures into those, how shortage figures into those in, in the next portion. But we do have to kind of have an, un, an outside understanding of what right you think you have. Um, so we're going to start with. 
Yeah. Should we, should we yeah. take a quick uh, uh, kind of uh, survey? Sure. Of the, are there any um, questions or um, uh, that you'd like to ask of Valerie of the previous information? I have a, a question, uh, Valerie. So far, so good. Uh, your your uh, explanation is really very, very clear and very concise. But one of the one of the things that I want to um, to discuss briefly is that uh, Sigma indicates that uh, we there's no limitation on water rights uh, mm -hmm. that you mentioned. Whereas um, you also stated that the GSA can limit water rights on an as-needed uh, basis, although not fully. Right. Uh, so what this does is that this puts us in the middle of a legal confrontation, it, it would seem to me. Uh, how, do we, how do we minimize the uh, illegal face-off in that regard? Yeah, it's, it's tough. I think you're right. It does put the GSA in a, in a um, challenging position, maybe I'd say. Um, you, you need to develop GSP's policies water accounting frameworks, all of that needs to not ever um, cut off or end or say you have no right, right? So you can't, we, we know that. And that's kind of the one kind of, um, I guess, you know, there's there's a, a spectrum and we know we can't say you're cut off, you're done, right? That's the job of a court and an adjudication. They could say, I'm sorry, your right has been prescribed or, or, or it's, it just doesn't exist. So a GSA can't do that and I don't think should do that. However, to get to sustainability, um, a GSA can say, you know what, for all overliers out there, you guys are at 50% until we can get this basin back into to where we're going. So my, my sense is that GSA shouldn't, um, should do a couple things to make sure that they don't get on the wrong side of adjudicating someone's right. And that is um, make rules or um, accounting frameworks based on these categories rather than a specific user. I think that's gonna be helpful. Um, and then really tie everything to sustainability. There are um, plans, and I think going forward, you're going to see this more and more, where people, they're going to be winners and losers in the system. And I think you just kind of have to continue to tie that to the sustainability plan. Um, and also that if we get out of sustainability and we had some miracle wet years where we had tons of surplus water, um, you wouldn't need to cut people off anymore. You could go back to exercising your entire full right. And that, to me, is kind of the one distinction. I know that doesn't help a farmer who's trying to grow something, but the distinction is we're limiting you and not taking your right away. Now, does that give you more water this year on farm? Maybe not. But if we had a lot of wet years and surplus years, at some point, you could go back to your full use. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the distinction. It, but it is, a, it is a tightrope that we're walking, for sure. Thank you, Valerie. Mm-hmm. Anyone else? All righty, Valerie. All right. Anything in the chat either. Great. All right, so Pueblo rights. Pueblo rights are um, not something that folks deal with a lot anymore. They were the issue of a lot of uh, City of LA uh, uh, adjudications in um, the early part of the century. And, um, but most Pueblo rights have either been adjudicated or resolved. But a Pueblo right is the most senior right, and it's based on um, a grant from a previous Spanish or Mexican settlement. Um, the city of LA has a Pueblo right. It was an establishment um, of a local government or city back from where the Spanish or Mexican municipality was um, historically there. So if you can say, hey, listen, this predates not only um, Sigma, but it predates really any sort of statehood. We've had this right for that long. Um, you have a Pueblo right. It is kind of based on this concept of municipal service. Um, you can't just be an overlier uh, that's outside of a city or outside of kind of a domestic service and claim a Pueblo right. Uh, again, it's the highest priority. So when you talk about shortage, folks who have an established Pueblo right usually get to use water in their entirety before anyone else is cut off. Um, and probably one of the more important things, it doesn't attach to any foreign water or imported water. So it can only, it can only attach to the water that's in the subbasin. If water's coming in from outside, the Pueblo right does not attach to that. So there are limitations. Um, but again, this doesn't come up a huge amount. It was 
all of the LA city of LA water rights cases were based on Pueblo rights and those were established. Um, I doubt that we'll see any future litigation of people successfully claiming Pueblo rights. Um, overlying rights, that's probably the most common. So ownership of land overlying percolating groundwater or a subbasin, um, that is the basis of an overlying right. Again, there's no permitting system. You're not gonna have a piece of paper telling you that you're an overlying water right holder. But if you own land that is over a subbasin with percolating groundwater in it, you are an overlying water right holder. It is the basis of land. Um, these rights are not quantified and that's purposeful. Um, you can use all the water that is needed to um, reasonably support a beneficial use. So for example, if you have 100 acres of overlying land and you um, can reasonably use three acre feet per acre or four acre foot per acre because of an orchard, that's great. Um, and that's the amount that you're able to use. You can't waste water, but you can have as much as, as you need to support the beneficial use on your land. Similarly, if you have a crop that takes much more water, um, if you're switching to a higher higher demand crop, you don't need to do anything. You can, you can use more water if you have a higher demand crop later. Um, but of course, as you can already imagine, the lack of quantification um, becomes a real problem when we start talking about shortage and who gets to use what, when, and how. So, um, so there is no specific amount. If you're an overlier, you have an amount that can support the beneficial use on your land, but for waste. Okay, overlying water rights are never municipal. Okay, that means that if you have a community water system, if you have a city that is, that is delivering groundwater, you are never an overlier. Even if you're delivering water to overlying water rate holders. So if you've got a municipality that's overlying a basin and all you're doing as a municipal municipality is taking that water out and giving it to people who are on overlying the groundwater basin, that still doesn't make you an overlier. You're still an appropriator. Um, so that is a little bit confusing, but um, just remember that municipal and public extractions cannot be supported by overlying rights. All right, so that leads us to what is an appropriative water right. And I'm doing this um, based on category of priority. So all overliers, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but all overliers get to take their entire supply before any appropriator can start diverting or extracting water. Okay, so that gets important when we talk about why you can't be an overlier if you're a, a municipal. Um, so it doesn't come from land ownership you can actually take uh, what it take, it comes from actually putting water to use. So uh, you can export, export water. Um, the overlying land owner can only use water on their overlying parcel. That, that is not a restriction that an appropriator has. Um, so you can use the water wherever you want. You can export that water and any municipal use is an appropriative use of water. The quantity, again, it is, it is um, not, you don't, because it's not permitted, you don't have a permit that says the quantity, but your quantity is limited. So your quantity is limited to the amount of appropriative water that you've extracted and put to beneficial use. So because of that, if you have overlying water rights and then you appropriate over and above your overlying right, you can become an appropriator if you are outside the basin and you begin to appropriate water somehow um, and you've always used 100 acre feet uh, for the, you know, since the time of appropriation, since the time you've been taking that water, that, that defines your use. So it is defined by quantity, but it's defined by how much quantity you have extracted historically. So very different than the overlying uses. It does not, um, run with land, it's not, you don't have to own the land to be able to appropriate water either. So quite a few differences, kind of the inverse of the overlying right. All right, so I'll, I'll stop there because the Pueblo or federally reserved rights, the overlying rights and the appropriative rights, those are the three basic rights that you have. We're gonna talk about prescription next. And a prescriptive right is just someone stealing someone else's existing right. 
So it is not a basis of right by itself. So really you have the three Pueblo, overlying or appropriative. I'm gonna talk about prescription now, but remember if you're a prescriber, it just means you're taking someone else's right. So those are the kind of the three basic rights that you're gonna claim without prescription. Those are the three reasons you could extract water um, out of the ground. All right, so prescriptive rights. Um, this is tough and it really is um, much more difficult in groundwater than in surface water. The concept um, applies, you can be a surface water prescriptor as well, um, but it, it's much more difficult to prove and um, creates a, a lot more trouble in the groundwater system because the lack of permitting. So a prescriptive right develops um, when someone who's not an overlying water right holder steals the water right of someone else who's not using their full right. There are four main components that you have to prove to be a prescriptive water right holder. Your use of that water that is not yours, that's someone else's, has to be open, actual, notorious. And what that really means is you're just not hiding it. You're not, um, you're putting it on land, that is an open use. Um, you're not putting the pump in some sort of you know, box or um, secretly exporting it. I don't really know how you do that, but really um, historically in case law, this is that, that people have to know you're putting it to use. So if you have a pump on your land and you're pumping the groundwater and growing crops and people see that, that is sufficient to say, I'm open, I'm doing this openly, notoriously, it's out, it's out in the open. It has to be hostile and adverse to the true owner. It has to hurt someone, okay? So you have to be taking something from someone else. We're gonna talk a little bit more about number two in a minute. It has to be under a claim of right you can't be saying, I know that I'm using your right and I think I'm borrowing it. It has to be that you think you're putting it on your land and using it for you, okay? So you have to, it can't be in a borrowing scenario. And there, and there are a whole bunch of really old historic cases where you can imagine that two people are next to each other and the person says, well, I was using it and I, they let me use it. It was theirs, but they were sharing it with me. That will defeat your prescriptive claim. Okay, so you have to say, yeah, I was using it. I was using this as mine. I want to take it. Has to be, and this is a very tough component, especially in groundwater, continuous and uninterrupted for five years. Okay, so you have to use that amount continuously for five years straight. And during that time, it has to be hostile and adverse the whole time. Both an overlying and appropriate rights are subject to prescription. Right? So you can steal someone else's either overlying right or appropriative right through prescription. All right, um, this is a very difficult component. This is why it's more difficult uh, for, for groundwater than surface water. That second adverse and hostile claim, that really means that it can't be during surplus. So if you're in a year where everyone has plenty of supply, you literally can't prescribe. There's no prescription. It won't even start. So it has to be in an overdraft year. And then um, it, can, it becomes, so the adverse requirement number two can only be when a basin is in overdraft. So you see these claims of prescription in court. And one of the very first things the court will say is, prove to me that you've had five consecutive years of overdraft. Okay, if you can't prove that, then, you abs then you're out already, no prescription. Um, and interestingly, prescription kind of flips the script a little bit on um, public and municipal supply compared to private overliers. Remember what we talked about before that um, a public supply cannot be considered an overlying supply. And that is tough because it, it sort of puts a public supply or municipality in a lower, um, a less priority category. But interestingly, when it comes to prescription, it's a one-way street. You can, a, a public agency or municipality can prescribe against an overlier, but an overlier cannot prescribe against a municipality. So this is where you see all the rules of priority kind of get reshuffled in overdrafted basins where municipalities have been um, consistently supplying the same amount of water. What happens is you reshuffle those decks and it makes shortage and figuring out who has priority really, really difficult and very, very fact intense. Um, and then the third component is the self-help concept. 
So if you have, let's say you say, yep, I, 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 we're in, we have 25 years of overdraft and all these municipalities have continued to serve their customers 100% and it's really the overliers who've had to reduce their supply, then that sounds like a fact pattern where prescription is really looking good. And it looks like some of the overliers have probably been prescribed. However, you can always do self-help, which means that if you did not reduce your own pumping in that time, then you can fend off any prescriptive folks. So um, if you have a scenario where you're an overdraft for five years, but you're an overlier and you've been pumping the exact same amount you've always pumped, you have protected yourself from prescription, right? You've kind of fended that off. You're playing a lot of defense um, and that's called self-help in the law. So when you go to one of these large comprehensive adjudications, they're going to ask a couple questions. First, when were you in overdraft? Two, did the municipalities come in and prescribe all the overliers? And guess what the overliers always say? They come and they say, heck no, they didn't. I was pumping the entire time too, which leads to what? Not a good problem on the ground. It leads to massive overdraft, right? These rules are causing everyone to kind of take the basin down. So you would be punished if you're someone who said, I'm an overlying water right holder, but I looked around and I knew we were in overdraft. So I conserved, I cut my use in 50%. That, that does, I mean, unfortunately, legally, that does not put you in a good position. So these, these rules are very challenging because they promote this kind of rush down to the bottom. Um, the tragedy of the commons was the, the quote that was used often in Sigma to talk about how you can't, you know, there was, there's a disincentive to really manage groundwater appropriately before Sigma because people were doing self-help. Um, and if you're an overdrafted basin, the best thing you could do is keep pumping, pumping, pumping. So you could um, fend off prescribers. Okay, so not the best public policy, right? Uh, so then Sigma comes along and recognizes that and says, hey, you know what, the first thing we have to do is stop this tragedy of common, stop running to the bottom of the basin. We're going to say, we're going to do a timeout and that no extractions um, be between the time Sigma is passed can be the basis or evidence to defend a claim against prescription. So they said, just stop. We've got to manage this. And, and so after 2015, there's really no evidence of self-help self anymore. So you can conserve and you know that that won't be used against you. Um, to be honest, most of the prescriptive claims probably long precede the 2015 deadline anyway, but it does help folks that, that thought that they were in overdraft. If you have a fact pattern of from you know, 2010 to 2015, that's your five year period of overdraft. It better be in overdraft all five years. Because if you have one of those years where you're in surplus and there was an, enough supply for everyone, it ruins anyone's prescriptive claim. Okay, so that five-year requirement for prescription has to be an overdraft the entire time. And Sigma, one of the very first things it says is we've got to stop this. We've got to stop this um, prescription against each other and kind of the difficult infighting. And we've got to stop promoting that people um, protect their right by pumping more, right? And same with appropriators. Remember, how do you, how do you establish an appropriative right? You pump, you pump water. So if you want to establish an appropriative right of, of 200 acre feet, that's how much you have to take. There's no way you can establish a right unless you pump it and take it. So Sigma, one of the very first things they did was we got to do a timeout and, and stop this um, kind of the, the policy leading people to overpump. All right. Uh, uh, there's a question. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, please. Because I think we're moving on to the next. Um, yeah, we'll take a funnel, right? Um, uh, Director Nelson asked, what category would Cal Water fall under since they are supplying water to the city of Visalia? Yeah, so they'd be an appropriator. They can't be an overlier. They're probably not a Pueblo unless they've made that claim previously. But my sense is that they'd be an appropriator. Um, but, a, but would they be considered a municipal appropriator or a private appropriator? I I think that they'd be considered a municipal appropriator. Okay. Director Nelson, does that kind of answer your question or is there a follow-up to that? Well, I, when I look at the different categories and I research and I've been 
reading up on water rights. I'm just trying to figure out, again, um, Cal Water came into the picture uh, many years ago, but it used to be mm -hmm. the city's water system. They sold it to Cal Water. Okay. So I was concerned at that juncture, did we lose any kind of rights that maybe the city had? Because it is a private company for profit. It's not municipal at that point. Right. And what does that do to the supply for the urbanist uh, areas? Yeah. And, that, and that's tough. So your question, I think, keys in on could you then prescribe against Cal Water when you couldn't prescribe against a city or a municipality, but could you have a prescriptive claim against a private entity? And the answer usually is yes. Now, I think they'd still have municipal supply, but you don't get that, um, you don't get that one-way street benefit of, of prescription. There's also a complication, you know, mutual water companies are also really difficult to deal with in this because they supply usually public domestic supply, but actually mutuals because they're not public agencies and they usually supply small can be overliers. They're just, just they're like a, four overliers get together and have a distribution system for their overlying water right. That doesn't, that is not something that usually means that you're um, a municipal or a public water system in the sense that you can still be an overlier. So mutuals are a little bit of a weird thing too, where they're not, they're, they, they really can distribute overlying water rights. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Erin, I have one question. Um, Valerie, we've got uh, my, my biggest um, argument in this whole Sigma thing has always been, we, we, can, we can conserve all we want here, but when you have entities pumping water 24 seven and pumping that water out of the basin, all we're doing is filling buckets for them because mm -hmm. we're, we're conserving here and that water's going, water doesn't stagnate below us, it's moving and it's moving to the west where those pumps are at. Now, I'm assuming that water, they own the, they probably own the land, but it, they're not farming it. It's being, I don't know, is that prescribed or is that actually, um, overliers but it's yeah. in the basin is there any way because i know some of this has not been before 2015 some of it has been recent i'm not gonna i'm not gonna name names because i don't want to have to keep looking over my shoulder right now but um but this, some of it has been recent and it's 24 7 does sigma have the teeth to slow that down to stop it yeah, I mean, that's, man, such a good, it's a good question for so many reasons. Um, you know, really, our GSA is going to develop, so far, they've been agencies that have taken a light touch, and they're going to manage things, and they're putting together long-term planning, but they've been very light on enforcement. Um, they have enforcement authority, but most people are trying to kind of come together and be collaborative, and it's hard to do that when you stick a siren on and, and have handcuffs. You know, pe so people have not taken the enforcement authority of Sigma, but my sense is that the, the question of GSA's enforcement authority and power is going to be tested moving forward when people can't get to sustainability, when they see, maybe to your point, folks who are um, taking water out of the basin and exporting it, that seems to be sensitive. I mean, as if you're an overlier, you can't take that, you can't do that. If you're an overlier, you can just take water and put it on your overlying parcel and that's it. So appropriators are the most junior, um, and my sense is that export happens with appropriators, and the GSAs are likely to, to have, if they're following water right priority, which they should, um, those are the folks who are probably going to be first on the chopping block. The question is, um, do you have kind of the, do you want to have the enforcement mechanism to do that? Um, and I think so far, largely GSAs have been worried about that. But I think as you're pushed into not reaching sustainability, people will begin to wear an enforcement hat more and more. And I think that there, I mean, there are just going to be winners and losers in the system. There always have been, and there always will be. The, the question is for groundwater, it's taking a long time because it's, it's frankly difficult to see, but it's also difficult for GSAs to get their enforcement bearings about them. Um, and I think that you will see that more and more as people are forced into non-compliance. Well, what I find disheartening is when you, a part of the appropriated uh, 
um, rule there is say you can export it. Well, man, that shoots us right there in the foot right there. Right. Well, it doesn't mean that you can't have export limitations by a GSA if it's not sustainable. They're, they're, that's the kind of the rule of that right. But a GSA can come in and a county. I mean, there are a lot of you know groundwater ordinances of counties that say you can't export water. So um, that that's the construct of that right, meaning you could do it, but it doesn't mean that you can always do it. Um, so that there's no doubt that that's going to be limited going going forward is my sense. Yeah. Well, my fear is though that, you know, you, you, you touched upon it that eventually we're going to find out that that's what's happening. Well, it's going to be pretty late by then. Yeah. We're probably going to be reaching our, our uh, that threshold at that point. And it's going to hurt a lot of people here before any action is taken. Yeah, and the next the next part of this, the pie, I kind of have been calling it the the pie challenge or the pie problem. It, it, that's where we're really going to talk about um, everything that you're talking about, which is who gets cut off and who doesn't, and what can you cut off. And it um, there's definitely more political parts of the next part of the discussion um, coming up. That's for sure. Who gets cut off and when you can cut them off is kind of the the pie issue. Yeah, Valerie, that's a good point. I wanted to highlight that I think that's the takeaway is your tiered level of where the reductions will become, where they will happen, and that an appropriative right has the, you know, the pres prescribers have the first cut, appropriators have the second cut, overlying holds the highest because we don't really have any Pueblo. So those are going to, the people who don't have the overlying right are going to, are going to feel it sooner, harder than an overlying right basically what I'm taking away. Yeah, that's right. Now, remember, when you prescribe an overlayer, you become that overlayer. Yeah, so right. yep. if, if you have a claim of prescription and you are claiming that you've prescribed an overlying right, you get to jump in there and be that person. You've literally taken their component of that right. Yep. Okay. So it's, <laughs> that, it's obviously not straightforward. So fact intense is the thing. You know, you, you can have a hundred different fact scenarios and they play into this differently. Then that will fit nicely in my engineering spreadsheet, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, Blake Wilbur also had a follow-up question. Um, can one basin's plan of sustainability work only if it doesn't impact another GSA's ability to achieve sustainability? So I think what he's alluding to is if some of that export water is headed to another GSA, and we say no more, do they have a claim that we've impacted their GSP? Yeah, um, well, I, there's a component of Sigma that basically says exactly what, what Blake just said, which is that your plan can't prevent another plan from reaching sustainability. Of course, um, like anything, I mean, what does that mean? What if, what if your plan is uh, perfectly lawful and within your water rate scheme, and what if their plan requires stealing or prescribing all of your basin's right. I mean, that, so it, 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 that is really tempered by the, um, common sense. Yeah. And the plan, the legality of the plan. I mean, I could say a thousand things in my plan and say, you're affecting me from not doing them, but, um, it, 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 it really is going to be checked by a lot of things. And we're going to talk a little bit about sub basin adjacent basin flows in the next part on how, if water moves from one basin to another basin, it is legally treated differently compared to between and amongst GSAs. Um, it doesn't have that different legal construct on it. So um, this is the most straightforward part. We're actually gonna get more complicated as we go down the funnel here. Did you, everybody hear her? It's gonna get more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so we, Also more interesting. Oh, there you go. <laughs> So without that, without any further ado, go for it. <laughs> All right. All right. So allocations and groundwater accounting. Um, so how, like what we've been talking about, how we apply a different fact pattern to the rules. So how do we take these facts that we have in a certain basin and apply them into the rule construct of priority, um, of correlative rights in the overlying folks? And so we're going to talk all about that, all about... Um, and I call it the pie challenge. We're going to get sick of talking about a pie at the end of this, but it's the, it's the way that I can think about it. Um, I don't know, mo most clearly. We're going to talk about 
what's groundwater and what's surface water, sizing of the pie, importing water, salvaging water, priority, prescription, and shortage, and how you deal with all of those in, in groundwater. Um, all right, so identification of groundwater is the very first step, and that is how big is the pie? Okay, we're, and this is probably the most important slide um, of the presentation, because it's really talking about what Sigma is about, what we can control and what we can't, what we have jurisdiction over and what we don't. And um, I think people are beginning to realize in Sigma, I don't know if it's an intended consequence or unintended, but really the way that people are going to account for things moving forward is going to shrink the pie, the groundwater pie is, is what I'm going to tell you. So before you can talk about how you manage groundwater, you have to figure out what is included in that. Not all water underground is just native supply that everyone has a right to take. Okay, so maybe I should say it again, not all groundwater underground is just free water that every single overlier or appropriator can take. That's, that's not really how it works. So native groundwater, that is water that every, that an appropriator or an overlier has the right to dip in and take when they're extracting, comes from uh, seepage from natural canals, recharge from precip, subsurface flows from adjacent groundwater basins, and percolation from applied groundwater. Okay, also some people kind of, um, you know, wash off from mountains, things that are naturally in the system that no one can claim a right to or a claim to or a or a, I owned that water before it seeped into the basin. Okay, that those are the native groundwater supplies. There might be some other ones, but really that that's it. So that's your pie. That's your groundwater pie. Probably what is not included in the pie might be more important. Why is the pie so small all of a sudden? It's because imported water, water that you bring from outside the basin that ends up in the basin is not part of native supply. That belongs to an importer. Stored surface water. So water where you are seeping from a canal. You know, let's say you have a surface water right holder and they divert water into a reservoir and they're putting it in their canal system and it's leaking, it's a very leaky canal system. That all of the seepage from that canal system is not native groundwater supply. That can be claimed from the importer. That is water that they diverted from a surface water right and they put it in their system. Maybe their system is leaky on purpose. We've had these arguments in court before where people specifically are recharging through leaky systems. So it's not an accident. They're not giving this water away. This isn't just free water that everyone can take. Maybe it has been treated that way historically. And that's where sickness gets really hard is that um, I can think of a lot of different clients that we have that had these systems who never really accounted for it. They had a leaky system but they weren't gonna account for every single molecule. But now that Sigma has come online and kind of forced folks to figure out what the pie includes, now they're forced to say, okay, well, what's in that pie and what's not? They're not gonna just say, yeah, I'm gonna continue to abandon all this water. They're gonna account for it in the way that they can account for it. And that's under the ledger of imported water. And it's theirs. It's, it didn't come into the system free. They spent a lot of money, my guess, is either a, a, a getting the water right paying for a reservoir, paying for a conveyance system. They invested in that water and it's theirs. Salvaged water similarly, um, and, and salvaged water usually is defined by water saved from waste. So um, really kind of iconic salvaged water um, examples are water that in a big flashy year would have gone through a natural system, um, but for storage. So someone has a reservoir and they stored a whole bunch of water up top. And because of that, it just didn't flow out of the system. They saved it and they're going to apply it to irrigation or apply it to some other beneficial use at a time it would not normally be in the system. They have salvaged that water. They saved it from just washing out of the system entirely. Okay. And, and how did they do that? They built a reservoir. They invested money in it. Wastewater as well. So water that needs to be treated to be used, okay? If, if water's unusable, if it's untreated, that's not really water we can count. But if someone invests in a wastewater treatment plant, 
They spend a whole bunch of money to make water that was not previously usable usable. They get to, they invested in it. They created, they salvaged this water. Okay. So it's kind of the development of, of new supplies or saving water from waste. Usually that costs money. Sometimes it can be conservation. There's kind of a historic case where there was an open canal system and someone built a pipeline. That pipeline saved 20% of evapotranspiration. Um, and they said, we didn't build that pipeline for free, but that 20% that used to leave the system, we just saved it and that's ours. So we want the, the 20% of efficiency and conservation we just invested in, that's our water. And, and because of that, when we apply it to a crop or when we put it, maybe you have a, a direct recharge program where you take that salvage water and you put it in the ground, you own that, okay? So the very first thing you need to do when you talk about water accounting, groundwater accounting, is you need to figure out what's native groundwater and what is not native groundwater. What can people claim and what will people claim? The interesting part, there's an old case called Oakdale versus Stevens that's kind of famous in the sense of um, someone had been having a leaky system for years and years and years and the downstream folks said, well, but I started, I started relying on that leaky system. You can't fix your system now. I'm, I'm, the, I'm growing tons of crops on the leak. And the court said, no, 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 no. You can choose to stop abandoning water anytime you want. So that's what we really have in Sigma is that now that people are asked to account for water, before they didn't need to put it on a ledger as much. They didn't need to say, okay, groundwater cutting and, and our system leaks, but you know, it is what it is. Now Sigma is kind of pushing us towards this concept of whose water is what and what can you claim? Um, and it is causing people to account for water differently, to claim water that they previously abandoned. You still have the right to do that. So um, again, it's an important slide because we're really talking about how big the pie is. I think a lot of people think the pie is this big. And after this very first stroke of the pen for um, sizing the pie, they're gonna realize the pie's smaller, smaller than they originally thought. Um, and Valerie, I thought, I yeah. thought I'd maybe add this point to, if, if we go back to the way that uh, we divvied up the numbers within the Kauia subbasin, yeah. Um, I think it was a negotiated native groundwater yield, um, mm -hmm. not a pure calculated because uh, there is imported water that the, uh, the GSAs and their member units have agreed to leave in the native number. That's which, right. Right. So you're saying divvy up between native and everything else. We actually here agreed to leave some of that imported and salvaged in the native category. Before. Sure. And there's and that'll have to be done. A lot of basins have done that. Um, it's very difficult to, again, the facts and then the rules. Even if you all agree on these rules, it's very difficult to understand, well, was that was that molecule of water in a natural stream system stored or was it natural? Because if it was natural, it belongs to the native yield. If it was stored, it should belong to the importer. So it's really difficult. At some point, you're gonna have to agree on estimates probably, right? You're gonna have to say, hey, listen, we can't account for every single thing. There's also a whole bunch of issues, not even in here that we could talk about, about timing. You know, if you, if you have a been, have you, you know, how long does water stay in this basin? Is it a bathtub basin where it stays until someone pulls it out? Or is it a flat basin that the water immediately migrates out of? In which case, you know, how long can you claim? I, 10 years ago, I over applied irrigation water. I want that water back now. Well, that water's gone. So we're not even talking about timing, whether the water stays there physically, um, how long you can store water there. All of those things are more negotiated points. And I think in order to move forward without a complete adjudication, GSAs are probably going to have to agree to that. There are other GSAs that have done that. Um, I, I have not heard of any GSA that doesn't have a fairly shockingly low native supply number. Um, I've heard of native supply estimates, like you're saying. It's not necessarily a very specific accounting but an estimate of um, all of the native groundwater components up top there in that first bullet point divided by the acreage, people are coming out at 0 0.15, 0 0.25, 0 0.30. And I mean, when I say that, that's native supply per acre. You can't grow a lot on that. Um, 
And, and those might be over adapted basins. Maybe in the North Valley, you're talking more like two or three acre feet per acre. You can grow things on that, but you may need to supplement it. So you're right. It's you, if, if you were in an outright adjudication where you had a decade long attorney and hydrogeologist, you could um, get into that. But I think most GSAs are gonna have to say, hey, listen, we can't account for every molecule. And in each water year, it changes, right? There's wet years, there's dry years. So um, there is gonna have to be some negotiation. You're probably gonna have to say, hey, listen, after five years, we don't think that we can count imported water seeped anyway, so. I think that goes to Director Stroman's question about how do we stay out of litigation? It's through actions like that, where we say, we understand that it's gonna hurt everybody. And I know Paul and I have these discussions. Well, we, we don't wanna to stand too hard because when we get to adjudication, they'll find that we go back to that 0.15 number because mm -hmm. the, the pie is so small for native. And they'll sure. realize that they had it better in the other condition, right? And um, that's how we avoid court director Stroman, it's it's trying to be as as at the table working with folks as possible so that's right and i i think you have to do an accounting but i also think you have to realize that you're not going to get every every molecule because it it would it would be too hard to account for it so at some point you have to have um categories and you kind of have to put certain water in certain categories and they're going to be estimates. It's not going to be um, as precise as, as mathematically as you, as an engineer may want it. I think that's true. All right. So this is probably that, like I said, a very important slide, um, a slide that I think is shocking and, and confusing to people. Um, but it is why, why are we talking about this pie being so small? Okay. So we're going to move on to um, you. Valerie, do you want to take yeah. this one question that came in oh, sure. from Johnny Gailey? Because I actually think it goes back a couple slides. Yeah. Would someone extracting an appropriator's or importer's seepage for many years acquire a prescriptive right to that water? And I Yeah. So if you're prescribing someone's <clears throat> right, you can prescribe someone's um overlying or appropriative right, okay? But you can't really, after Stevens v. Oakdale, you can't really say, I'm gonna just continue to, to steal the water that I know is yours and you have to keep supplying it to me. So you can take someone's right. If you're in overdraft, you can say, yeah, I took your right. But you cannot force someone to continue to abandon water to support your needs. There's a distinction there. So. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, you may have overdraft and you may fight about how, uh, you may fight about the number in the first bullet on this screen, right? You can say, no, 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 you now, I just stole your overlying right to all of that kind of water. And so you don't have a right. So I get more of a percentage of that water, but you can't really tell someone they need to continue abandoning their surface water supplies or their imported supplies to groundwater. So um, there, there's a major distinction there. You can kind of steal amongst and between the first category, but I don't think you'd be tremendously successful trying to tell someone that they need to continue to supply you with their pre-owned water. Um, and part of that is the difference, not to get too deep here, but your water right before you divert it is called a use of fructory right. And it's kind of an option. It's, it's I mean, it's a legal right, but there's only water to divert or extract if it's available. The second category, why the pot pie is so small category, those people have already diverted that water. That's possessory. So once, if water's flowing in a stream and you have the right to take it out, once you've taken it out lawfully, it, le it goes from a usurfactory and option right to yours. You own that molecule of water. And that's the second category of right we're talking about, which is why it's more protected. So you can steal and you can prescribe, but that prescription is really limited to um, the first category of water. The second category of water, those people have already, they've already possessed the right, it's theirs. They're holding it in storage. They're, they're taking it off the river, assuming that they're doing it lawfully, it's theirs. Does that make sense? All right. 
All right, so who do we have to feed? Who does this pie have to feed? Um, Pre-Sigma, this is actually something that Sigma kind of has helped with a little bit. Um, there was, if you go to an adjudication, one of the things you'd immediately start talking about is hydrologic connectivity. And um, the pie that you're talking about and who you have to feed is um, based on connectivity. So there were a whole bunch of cases early on that said, hey, listen, I've got this basin, but I'm not really connected to those people over there. So I just want you to, to understand my right as it is to this pie. I don't wanna talk about that other pie. It might kind of come back and forth, but, but really the rules as to each other and priority is to just water that's hydrologically connected. Now, Sigma has defined that um, bulletin 118 boundaries as, as the um, terms of connectivity moving forward for any other adjudications. So really that is kind of nice because you're not gonna fight about whether you're hydrologically connected to anyone else. It really is the Bulletin 118 basins that you have to feed and that's your pie and that's who you're comparing to. So an overlier in the Cahuilla Basin has to, um, in a time of shortage, they have a co-relative right. They have to reduce with other overliers in that pie, but in a different basin that you, you may have to a totally different need to reduce and a different need of shortage. So really we're talking about who are we feeding? It's just this pie and your, and your rights are relative to each other. So this matters a lot. Um, and it matters even more in Sigma because these last two points, which is when water leaves your subbasin, remember that was one of the native components. I hate to go back, but do you see what in that first um, native groundwater subsurface flows from adjacent subbasins? Okay. So what does that mean here? That means when water leaves your subbasin, goes to a different subbasin, you may still have the legal right to it, but it's now native supply for someone else. It just left your subbasin. It left your your pie left the table. It's gone. Now because you're in the same pie with several GSAs, it doesn't mean the same when it crosses GSA boundaries. So for example, if Greater Korea and Mid Korea have a flow back and forth, that doesn't reset any legal terms. That's still it's still someone's um, water. But but again, when it crosses over and it goes into someone else's subbasin, if it's groundwater, if it's native groundwater, then that water's gone. And that is supply for them. And similarly, if water comes across into the Kauia subbasin, that's native supply that you just got. Um, so the connectivity, who do you have to feed, who's in your pie does, does make a, a big difference. And if you're losing a ton of water to a different subbasin, if it's groundwater, and you can't fix that and you can't really get it back, um, then that becomes a real challenge. Now, if it's imported water, it's still yours, but you may have a physical, um, you might have a physical challenge of telling that person, stop taking it. Um, you know, what, what um, you know, other than physically stopping it and controlling it, you're gonna have a challenge there. So, um, so anyway, who does the pie have to feed and connectivity used to be a huge fight in adjudications. Um, <clears throat> in Glendale and San Fernando, it was one of the main fights, right? Cause they developed a couple different basins and it was just a pie. And when you have shortage, it's just in your pie. So um, Sigma did help with that. And we can kind of move forward knowing that our pie is our bulletin 118 boundaries. All right, so who gets the first piece of pie? right? Who's served first? <clears throat> Pueblos, overliers, appropriators, okay? Unless there's prescription and unless someone cuts in front and a prescription takes someone's overlying right, then they jump in and they're an overlier, okay? Now, interestingly, these are the category, we're going to talk a little bit about shortage amongst and between these categories in a minute, but these are the categories that you um, serve pie to first. So all Pueblos get 100%. If there is demand for 100% of that pie in the Pueblo category, overliers and appropriators get nothing. Okay, in this basin, there's not Pueblo supply. So overliers have priority and all overliers will be served in their entirety before an appropriator has the right to come online. And if there's tons of water for everyone, then there's plenty of pie, everyone gets a piece, no one complains. But if you run out of pie before you get to the end, this is how it goes categorically. 
Uh, Valerie, there's a question yeah. here from Soapy. Um, yeah. Can the GSA change uh, agreement to define native versus salvaged year to year? I mean, I guess, I guess you can always agree to, um, yeah, you can always agree to have like leave behinds. You know, in water banking programs, there's always kind of like a, we're gonna we're gonna put in this amount of water and we're gonna leave behind ten percent. I don't know if that's what she's talking about um, with year to year. And I mean, just really quickly, yeah. I was just, uh, one of the things that um, Aaron said was that within our sub basin, the, the three GSAs have agreed um, on the difference between leaving some of the salvage water and claiming it as a native. Can they go back on, do they review that or does it become in stone or does it get reviewed year to year so that if someone changes their mind and says, I don't wanna count that anymore as salvaged, if one GSA says that, how does that play out? Yeah, well, I mean, I think like any negotiation, um, if, if you've agreed to the water accounting framework and that you'll leave behind or you'll kind of abandon some of your salvage supply, you could probably try to renegotiate it. My sense is that that would be difficult to go back on, um, <clears throat> which is why I think it's important that you have this kind of agreement and um, kind of foundational understanding maybe. Um, but like any negotiation, you can always go back and say, hey, you know what, we, we mischaracterized that and we're not getting to sustainability and we need it back. Sure, you could, you could do that. I'm, if I were the other GSA, I wouldn't love it. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> yeah. All right. Any other questions right now, Aaron? No, but uh, just a question for you, Valerie. Do you want to take a break? You've been going through this. I, I wanted to let talk. you- I could talk all day long. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but if there are questions, stop me. We're, we are getting, I think we're at, I forget, we're, we're maybe at the last five slides, but they do get, <clears throat> they're the last, you know, they're the most difficult slides, so. All right, so managing shortage within categories. So there's there's not enough pie, right? There's We know that we're not in surplus and we know that we from the last slide, water right priority rules require reduction by category first. Okay, so let's say you do that. We don't, let's hypothetically say we don't have Pueblo, but we have a lot of water for overliers, but not enough for every single overliers, right? So how do we, how do we deal with shortage within a category. That's really what this is driving at. So shortage within an overlying water right category is what they call correlative. And that means that you have to reduce by your proportionate fair share of the total amount. Clear as day, I'm sure. Um, it's not clear, people fight about this a lot. You have, um, let's say, 100 acres of overlying um, land and everyone uses two acre feet per acre. And so your overlying demand is 200 acre feet, but you really only have supply for 100, okay? So immediately out of the gate, you're thinking, well, I think overliers can have 50% of their demand, right? But then people say, well, not really. I know my neighbor has been really, you know, growing alfalfa, growing a very high required water crop. I've actually done a lot of conservation um, I've been, you know, growing on half the, you know, my allotment, I conserved in house. Is it really a proportionate fair share for him to get one acre feet per acre and me to get one acre feet per acre? I don't, I don't think so. So when you're dealing with correlative rights, usually you kind of take them as a category and say, listen, we've got to reduce you by as much supply as we have, but there are a lot of arguments in between, um, to kind of affect how that works. If you have enough water to supply all of your appropriate, excuse me, all of your overlying water rates. So you've got Pueblo out of the way and you you say, we have enough, to, every overlier will get what they want. Then you move on to appropriation. And those appropriators, the rule is not a proportionate reduction. It is first in time, first in right. Much more like the surface water system that we all know and love is that the first appropriator gets 100% of their right before the second appropriator can get any of theirs, okay? So let's say you have 
the 100 acres of overlying rights and they have a two acre feet demand um, and you have um, 300 acre feet in supply. Okay, so you can get all of the overlying folks get 100% of their demand, they're thrilled. And then you turn to the appropriators and say, we have 100 acre feet left over for you. And the person first in line says, great, my, I, have a, I have an appropriative right of 100, I'll take it all. Thank you. And that's great. Now, that, the difficult part about this is who's first in time, first in right? Who, so it all has to go back to factual when you first were an appropriator. And what makes this so difficult is unless you're a municipal and you can't be an overlying water right holder, sometimes people say, well, you're an overlier. You're not an appropriator. So you already got your share. So get out of my way. But there are a lot of times fights, fights about that. If you can be an overlier and an appropriator. Um, and then, of course, like kind of overarching all of this is kind of the need to supply, you know, the human right to water and domestic um, supplies and the need to give appropriators some water out of the system. That's not really in the rules. Um, it's a practical impact that we all have to think about. And we probably do need to think about some set asides to allow that to happen. But frankly, it's not in the rules of priority and shortage. So amongst Overlying water right holders, you all have to share the pain. You all have to reduce by a certain amount. But when it comes to appropriators, it is first in time, first in right. And those who um, have a prior right to appropriation get to take all of their supply before anyone else. So when there's not enough pie, that's how you have to do it. You have to look at exactly who, who needs what and how much supply you have per demand. All right. So this is a little bit of an overview, but prescription, you know, did you just steal my pie? And did you just cut in front of me, kind of? Again, prescription happens when there's overdraft, when water is open, actual, notorious, hostile, and adverse, uninterrupted for five years, and the one-way street component. And a lot of overdrafted basins um, that have been, have a comprehensive adjudication, what happens is municipal, because of the one-way street, municipal suppliers often come out ahead of where they would normally come out if you didn't think about prescription. So it really depends on the facts, but if you have facts where you have a very long, um, long held and long delivered municipal supply, a long period of overdraft, and people kind of coming in and out of, of use for overliers, usually the municipality will end up fairly whole in that situation, even though they're a junior. So it really depends on the facts. If you, if you don't have those facts, if you don't have long-term overdrafts, um, then a lot of times the municipals will still be a junior. But a lot of times where there's serious overdraft and municipals have been delivering supplies for a long time, prescription does flip priority and shortage quite a bit and they can come in and swoop in and take that pie that you thought was cut for you. So, it, but again, prescription is so fact dependent, it's really hard. All right, so dormant overliers, an issue that is always out there. Um, and, and recently the Antelope Valley decision came out and, and had a little bit to say about this. Do we save pie for people not at the table? Okay, so if you're an overlying water rate holder, one of the components of your use is you don't have to use it. So non-use from a legal perspective doesn't end your prescriptive right. You can always come on. If you're overlying a, you know, a groundwater basin, you cannot farm your land or you can sell it and start farming it and start exercising your overlying right. Um, so again, use is not a requirement to preserve an overlying right. It is, however, for an appropriator. So if you have five years of non-use as an appropriator, you'll be subject to forfeiture. Okay, but this concept of we're now trying to do this water allocation and there's someone who's an overlier who hasn't used their right in years. How are we supposed to, you know, there's not enough pie to begin with. How, he's not at the table. So are we supposed to cut a big chunk of the pie and just let it sit there? in case that person wants to come on and off the system, becomes very, very difficult. So um, this is called, what's called subordination of dormant overliers. And that means if you're an overlier and you don't currently use water, 
it, you could obviously be subject to prescription, right? You're the person who's going to be prescribed first if you're an overdraft, first of all. Second of all, in adjudication, there's kind of a long history of putting these folks in a category and setting them aside with a very small amount of water, kind of subordinating them, telling them, we know you're an overlier, but really you haven't come on and used water in a long time and we're going to sideline you. So last week, the 5th DCA, the 5th District Court of Appeals came out with um, a, a upholding the lower court decision in Antelope Valley, which was a comprehensive adjudication. And they said this, they said, listen, we're not cutting you out completely dormant overliers, but if you don't come on and use that water, you've probably been prescribed in an overdrafted system. Um, and we have a way through this physical solution, through the adjudication, where you can come on and get some water, but you're gonna have to pay for it. And it's not gonna be a lot. Um, and frankly, you just, you you know, we figured out who had a right here and you weren't at the table. So you just didn't get a lot of pie. You kind of got the scraps in this in this picture here. That's what we saved for you as a, as a, <laughs> as a subordinated dormant overlayer. So, um, you know, in adjudications, there's long been held that you can't do an adjudication and just cut certain people out. You have to look at priority. But in the Antelope Valley case, the court said, you know, we did think about priority. We thought long and hard about priority. So this decision didn't excuse water right priority, but you weren't here and you probably got prescribed. And um, it's the application of priority that really allowed us to cut you out. So that that is an issue. Um, if you have a lot of grazing land, I know in Kern, there's a lot of area, um, fairly large acres of dormant overliers. And the question is at GSA is, what do you do with those folks? You're not a court, so I wouldn't put them out of business totally, but should you really be cutting out big pieces of pie and having them sit on the sideline when really, you know, you need to supply folks with water? So I'll take, I don't know if there are questions, Aaron, but I'll take a brief yeah, there's, there is one question. Does the utilization of a water marketing system still address overliers or do they become part of the market by default and can have their water traded? So I think he's basically asking, can overlying water rights be traded? Yeah, and that's, that's one of the real challenges of water markets. I mean, water markets, I always think of are frankly just kind of an agreement or a negotiation to move water around in a way that's that allows you collectively to kind of walk away from the water right priority system. So it really depends on um, if anyone challenges you. If you came up with a water market where overliers were recognized and dealt into that market and no one was going to challenge it, yeah, you can move, you can be really dynamic and nimble and move water around. That's all easier said than done though, because if someone doesn't like that and challenges it, the first thing they'd say, this question is exactly right, which is you just took an overlying water right, which is limited to the overlying parcel and moved it all around. That's a fundamental um, limitation of groundwater rights and you can't do that. So water markets are hard. I know they're very popular and I'm not saying they can't be done, but do remember that it is, you are all kind of holding hands and jumping off the, the you know, the, the bridge together, uh, hoping, hoping that no one challenges you because you really are walking away kind of in a, in a settlement context of, from, from the, the more rigid rules of, of water rights. But as long as you do that together um, and no one's gonna challenge it, then, then some of the rules, as you can hear from this, are really rigid. It's hard to get anything done if you're gonna be super rigid. Um, but yeah, it, technically a lot of water markets would violate rules of priority. Um, Sophie has her hand up. Sophie, did you have a question or is that relation to the previous one? I have a quick, a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. If you have, if you're considered a subordinate user because you're running cattle and Kern, but you decide you want to put it in grapes, mm -hmm. you've been subordinated. Uh, how do you reclaim your rights or how does that work? Right. So I mean, I wouldn't suggest any GSA subordinate because, of course, subordinate means you have had your overlying right compromised, really. And courts can do that after they've thought about it and after about 10 years of, of hearing, hearing evidence. Um, but I guess if I were advising a GSA, I would, I would have them look at adjudications and what's been upheld. And I would never say 
you're out completely. But what I would do is I would say, hey, listen, if you're that cattle farmer and you're going to go to grapes, um, until you want to step up and be an, an overlier, we're going to distribute your kind of your cut to the whole pie, but then I'm going to have a way for you to come in. So when you want to put grapes in and you need a more um, solid uh, um, supply, I'm going to deal you into the demand. Now, I might not deal you at 100%. But you might have a set aside or limited pools or deal ins. That's what that those that's what those words mean. Those are tools that previous adjudications have used. Saying we've got a hundred acres of dormant overlying use. We're not going to cut them off, but when they want to come back on, they can really only come back on for fifty acres. So it doesn't totally count them out, but um, it it doesn't allow them to be treated the same as everyone else who's been using um, the, the right and relying on it. You can use a whole bunch of different tools, but as a GSA, you have to be really careful because if I were an overlier, I'd say, yeah, no, you're not a court GSA. You can't adjudicate my right. So deal me in. Um, but so it's going to be an argument. So the support, the when you say so you've been subordinated, it does mean a, a, a court usually has told you you're not going to have the same right as your other um, overliers because you've been dormant. So you want to be careful about that as a GSA though. I think you even, even in the Antelope Valley case, you want to be real careful. Um, and I would suggest having some sort of deal in or limited pool or, or some sort of, we're going to set aside this amount of water for those folks to come on at some point um, in the future. That's probably the safest way to go about it. And I think in the I think in the Kauia subbasin we probably have some small fraction of that scenario, but it's probably much more limited than the um, Kern County folks because I think we're pretty much farmed up to the the foothills with a few interdispersed areas, right? So yeah, and water water markets have had to deal with that too. One of the first questions that water marketer folks, if you want to come in and do a market in an area, one of the first questions they ask is how much dormant use is there? Because the whole question is we can't, a water market probably can't deal new people in. We already are dealing with shortage. So if you don't have to deal people, you know, if you don't incentivize people to come to the table, then you're increasing that demand, right? So if you're creating a water market, it always works better if you have very little dormant overliers. Because if you create the market, what that's telling that dormant overlier is, you now have a reason to exercise that right because of the market that you didn't before. So you're actually asking kind of, you're encouraging people to increase demand. And of course, that's not the thing you want to do. So it's hard. It's hard. All right. Um, we're almost done. I think we only have like two slides left. So in, in loop pumping is going to also be another really tough, tough component that hardly anyone has touched but there are water code provisions that protect in-loop pumpers. Um, the in-loop pumping problem is I brought my own pie, okay? And that, if you're an in-loop pumper, it means you have an overlying groundwater right. You have not been extracting groundwater because you have been getting surface water instead, okay? So it promotes conjunctive use. It helps the basin. It's very helpful. But interestingly, if you're an in lieu, we we'll go back to the idea of prescription. So you're sitting there as an overlier and you don't use groundwater because you have a surface water supply. If I were a prescriptor, I'd say, well, I just took your groundwater, right? You haven't used it, right? You've been dealing with surface water and good for you, but I just took your groundwater supply. But the water code protects in lieu users and an in lieu use is an actual extraction of groundwater. So it means that they do have this built-in self-help. They have a built-in defense. So if you have been an in lieu user and been getting surface water supplies instead of using groundwater, you are protected from prescription. Okay, so it's going to be very interesting going forward whether in lieu users are going to then turn and say, you know what, not only am I protected from prescription, but I've actually been banking that water that I haven't used all these years. Um, again, it's this concept of do we really want to increase the supply? That's probably not helpful. Um, and Sigma does require any sort of um, in lieu use does have to be disclosed and quantified um, through Sigma and GSPs. 
So the concept of if you're going to kind of claim that in lieu use, you're going to have to do it going forward through through the GSPs. Um, but but it is an open that last that second to last bullet point of whether in lieu users who really have been doing a big favor to the basin, whether they can rely on claims of banked water that they don't use because of their in lieu use um, does remain to be seen. Legally, I think they have a claim, um, but it, it does, again, it, it kind of goes back to shrinking that original pie um, and, and it makes it more difficult to get to sustainability if you allow the in lieu folks to say that. But certainly through water code provisions, they are protected from prescription if they're using that. So in dry years, if they needed to pump, they would be able to do that most likely. All right, um, last, last substantive slide here, reasonable and beneficial use. That applies to um, groundwater as it does to surface water. And I guess the best way for me to say that is like, don't give the little kids at the table these huge pieces of pie. They're not gonna eat it and they're gonna waste it. And so you really have to apportion it. I mean, when you're thinking about cutting a pie, you know, think about that. Is that person gonna eat it? I always serve them that pie and they never enjoy it. They never eat it. I'm gonna give them a smaller piece because of it. That's really kind of the idea here. Um, you have to use water reasonably and beneficially. If you're going to waste it, if you're not going to eat it, you cannot be served it. So um, adjudications often lean hard on this. They take kind of a develop a, a physical solution component um, that really says it's just simply not fair to give these folks who are big water users that have zero efficiency and they're growing tons of, um, you know, low value, high use water crops. I mean, I don't want to get into that because it's very controversial, but at some point, the idea of what's reasonable and beneficial, um, it does develop through time. It's not, all the case law says it's not in a vacuum. You don't, you don't make that um, determination with blinders on. If everyone in the basin is conserving huge amounts and you're sitting there slopping around in water, your reasonable and beneficial use um, characterization will probably be lowered as well. So it is relative. Um, it is something that, uh, uh, um, it's that kind of equity provision that courts like to take when they're doing adjudications, which is this just doesn't seem fair so it's not reasonable and beneficial. So we're gonna kind of reallocate it. It's this concept, the same the same concept in water markets where you walk away from the rigidity of the rules to have some fairness. Um, I would say the human right to water has some overlapping concepts here too. Um, you know, if you need a, a very small domestic supply and all the domestic users have gone down conservation and they're using, you know, two gallons per person per day, can you ask them to do any more, is it still reasonable for someone else to use huge amounts of water? And the answer to that's probably no. Um, so it's really, I, I, it, it is kind of the great equalizer a little bit. I, I wanna be careful that I think sometimes um, these, these constructs go a little too far. Um, there's still a right that we're talking about. We don't wanna take that right away, but reasonable and beneficial use is something that courts use a huge amount in adjudications as an equity component. So, yeah. So anyway, with all of that and all of those considerations about how you divide up the pie and what that pie is and um, who gets which piece first and how much should they get and did someone steal your piece right before you ate it and whether you should really give someone the piece that they're legally um, entitled to because they're just not good eaters. All of these are big, real, real picture questions that when you're um, when you're in a quiet title action, they really become briefed and argued for decades. So, um, so anyway, the GSA should take a cautious approach, but you're going to, these are the rules. These are the rules we're going to all have to understand in order to negotiate kind of a fair way to move forward. Clear as day, right? Yeah. And I think, uh, we are all digesting, uh, -huh. <laughs> your, uh, your, your presentation here. I just want to say thank you. Um, man, it, it just, it re-highlighted all the, all the issues that we went through two years ago, brought them right back up fresh. And from the questions I'm seeing, I think everybody's, uh, the questions are elevated to the point where 
you're hearing more like implementation questions, right? How are we gonna put this in place? What are the markets gonna do? So that's great. It, it's really where we wanna see this headed. There was, there was one question that uh, came up from Richard is uh, the impact of Pueblo uh, rights in the Cuya subbasin or specifically mid Cuya. And I just responded to the best of, I, I don't think to the best of our knowledge, there are any Pueblo rights within the Cuya subbasin. They would have been right. well established. So. Yeah, they would have to be like the city of LA is your typical. That was a Spanish city before the state became, before California became a state. And that's what you're really talking about. Was there a little town here that was a, in a Spanish or Mexican land grant? Um, so you'd have to have some real historic. And keep in mind, people hire historians all the time to, to do this kind of thing. But you'd have to have some real historic municipal um, uh, uh, facts to establish that. Well, we're we've we're we're still here and available for questions. I know there's a we covered a, a huge topic in a what I consider a abbreviated time period. Um, are there any questions from folks? Um, I think Valerie, if you're okay, I can make this PowerPoint available to folks. Sure. Um, yep. It was this this session was recorded, and I'm I, I will figure out a way to get it to folks who would like it. I don't think I'll be posting it anywhere. Um, but I guess that's a good question, Valerie. Is that appropriate to distribute it to folks that were either not here or would like a copy of it? Sure, I think that's fine. It's a public record and um, I don't think I said anything too bad. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll pull it up in about five years. That should be fun. It's always fun to, to, to re see things. Yeah. And it's interesting, like as of a couple of days ago, there's case law coming out is where, so you're evaluating case law on a daily basis is this may all change a little bit, right? And we're going to get more. Yeah, and it's always updated and, um, you know, how courts are able to do things more nimbly and how, you know, there's no doubt that GSAs and their attempt to satisfy all these rules will be challenged too. And that will be case law, I'm sure, you know, that hopefully not me, but I don't know, my kids, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll fight about. Yeah, we'll uh, keep, keep the folks updated on those as we move through the GSA board meetings. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, can the case by case implementation of staff report recommendation become a sidebar to adopted regulations? Not. Howard, can you elaborate on that? Oh, Howard, you're on uh, mute. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Aaron. And thank you, Valerie, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, it was great uh, and, and concise. Uh, I was just referring to an item that I ran across and it kind of jogged my um, uh, interest. It says that uh, generally there are two pathways to implement recommendations, either on a case-by-case -case basis or by adopting resolution. Uh, so the, the question that I have is that, you know, you can't do both of those uh, simultaneously. It's either one or the other. And I'm just kind of wondering, can a case-by-case -case implementation of the staff report recommendations, uh, can that become a sidebar in case where there has there is adopted regulation, I don't I don't know if I'm going to answer your question. So if I don't, please ask me a follow up. But sure, um, and maybe it gets back to some of the um, questions Miss Mulholland asked as well. I don't. I think we've got to come up with kind of a a structure or a framework about how to treat this at a big picture level and about categories. I think, I think if you're saying case by case basis, like a certain case by case use, I don't think that the GSA should, prop, not only would it be exhaustive and kind of the same as an adjudication and take a ridiculous amount of time, but I don't think that the GSA is probably in a place to do that. So I don't, I don't know if that's answering your question, but I think we, I think you've got to come up with a framework on how to treat general categories. Of yeah, that, right, uh, I think that does answer my question, Valeria. Yeah. Indeed, uh, there is a, uh, a necessity to come up with a framework uh, as to how to go forward with this in cases where there are some disputes and there is a uh, there is a uh, kind of a confrontation between regulations, uh, ways and means by which to deal with the legal uh, aspect of, of certain things. 
So uh, that it, it can become complicated, but I just kind of want to get some clarity on that. And, and thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, do we have anybody else with uh, any questions? Um, if not, Valerie, again, I, I just wanted to commend you on an excellent presentation. Sure. Hopefully everyone will sleep, sleep well after hearing it, but it's a lot. It's a lot. And it's from a practitioner's perspective, it's really interesting, um, but it can be overwhelming. So if people have questions, if you go back and look at this or think about it or think, how does that work in this specific scenario, feel free to, to bring it up at board meetings or reach out. Um, but yep. But if you're going to ask a question, you got to bring it, bring a piece of pie. So. That's right. That's right. I do like pie a lot. <laughs> you can probably hear. <laughs> Um, so I, uh, that concludes our, our workshop, and um, uh, I guess I'll turn it back over to Dave for the easiest part of the uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I just wanted to reiterate, reiterate what everyone else has been uh, texting. It was a great presentation, and uh, especially even for those of us that have heard this kind of stuff for years and years, it's always good to hear it again. It gets the wheels turning again. We've got our work, uh, we definitely have our work cut out ahead of us. And uh, and the uh, it's a great time to be a lawyer, I guess. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> um, is there anything else? Not from my end. Oh, thanks again. If there are no more comments or questions, uh, our next regular meeting is April 13th. Thank you everyone for coming and uh, the meeting is adjourned. We don't see everybody. Happy Easter. Yeah, same. Thank you. Same.